Salutations, listener. It is I, Eric J. Checky, joined here by I am out of jokes, the boy. Hey. <laughs> uh, and we're here bringing you, of course, the Two Nerds podcast. A um, little more than usual to get out of the way before we get started. But, of course, I do want to ask you to like, comment, favorite, subscribe, share damn links. Uh, it really helps us out. We'd really like more people to hear our stuff and get involved, you know? Uh, and get involved! Hell, we got Twitters that are right there in the description. Um, fuck it, I might as well plug the forum at this point, too. Uh, come on by. Have some fun. It's, it's nice. We like you, listener. Um, also, I didn't properly, uh, plug, uh, my good friend, uh, my, my current, uh, dungeon master, and, um, uh, one hell of a blogger, uh, David Gardner. Uh, I wasn't sure if I had full rights. Uh, there will be a link to his blog in the description. It's Game Master Problems. That's because of the gay. So head on over there and uh, check out his stuff. It's pretty fun. You can see details of my adventures and uh, that the boy is sadly not a part of, but Brandy is. I had to work, sadly. Yeah. Um, and of course, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. As always. Super Blizzard, his uh, his his Shining Wizardo theme, Let's Get Hardcore. That's that's our theme song, and it's really awesome, and you should buy it. It would be really great if you did. And you should buy his other music, his Bandcamp page, linked also right down there in the description. Nothing is stopping you but the depth of your wallet. I believe he even has a, you know, make your own price, yeah. So, I mean, really, it would make you a cooler person than you are now. Yeah, it definitely would. Plus, you'd be supporting a guy who's trying to make some awesome games. It's like a a Pokemon thing called uh, Puppet Kingdom. It looks really cool, very stylized. Um, now, a couple of things. Uh, we were originally going to do a resurgence, uh, a renaissance, if you will, of our old video. Our top 20 favorite movies of all time at this point in time. We were um, going to shave it down to 10. Yeah, shave it down to 10, give you the updated list. Still might do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's still on docket, but uh, Brandy was unable to join us, and she was part of that original podcast, so I think it'd be... I think it'd be a little, uh, you know, just... We'd be remiss not yeah, to include her yeah, in this definitely. One. Um, also, the actual topic of this week's podcast, since I'm sure you know how to read as well as listen, um, is... Or you were very lucky to make it here in the first place. Yeah, you just found this YouTube channel and you're like, you know, I'm going to go with it. Um, this is, looks like a cool icon. Yeah, sure. two words, two nerds, I'm down. <laughs> click, click. All right, here we go. Uh... Uh, we're talking about uh, game mastering, or dungeon mastering, or storytelling, if you're a white wolf kind of person, uh, or any number of things. GMing, DMing, what have you. Um, we were kind of hoping to time it closer to the release of the Dungeon Master's Guide for the new d- edition of D&D, but that's but, not till November. And I'm not waiting till November, that seemed like a lame thing to do. Yeah, let's let's round out our month of role-playing before the inevitable Night of Champions with... Uh, oh, God. Some talk about uh, about running a game and what running a game is like and, and that sort of thing. Um. So uh, we just came up with this idea very very shortly prior to recording, so there may be a little more stumbling than usual. But running a game, DMing, it's probably at this point in my role playing career my favorite part of role playing. I like DMing a lot. It enables me to tell stories in a way that I can't really do otherwise. Um, I like DMing a lot, too. I'm kind of taking a downswing on it. Well, I have been, anyway. Uh, my juices ran out. and all, I, all I've been doing lately is ripping off other things and translating them into games for people who will never experience the original material. Because I refuse to do certain things. Uh, most notably, I've made campaigns based on Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy IX. I'm almost positive we talked about this before. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we probably talked about it during either the first D&D podcast. Something like that. Um, or the first, like, the Fandoms podcast, something like that. But I'm running a Chrono Trigger game that is bridging into Chrono Cross. We're taking a break from that between games. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... It's a challenge, you know, it takes a certain kind of person. Not everybody can be a DM, but everybody can try. And I think, really, most people should try. Once you've been role-playing long enough to get the idea, once you've been role-playing long enough to be, you know, comfortable in your shoes, give DMing a shot, an honest shot. And here's why I think that. For the longest time in my D&D career, I just did not think I would be a good DM. 
I didn't think I had the skills necessary, I didn't think I had the storytelling chops necessary, and I didn't think I had the multitasking ability necessary to properly DM. And it took a long time for White and Brandy to convince me to give it a shot. Eventually I did, and look where we are today. Probably my f some of my favorite memories of role-playing were things I was DMing. And I know that sounds like patting myself on the back, but when you hear more about how I personally DM, I think you'll understand that it's really, really not. Well, no. I mean, it's DMing is really group storytelling. I mean, there's... There are those more traditional DMs where it's, you know, the old dungeon run. I've set up a dungeon and you guys go through it, or I've set up a temple or whatever. Uh, it's basically they put forward a puzzle for you to solve with different tricks along the way, and you solve it, or you don't. That's not necessarily advanced. Smart. Really, you're more complex campaigns, your more rich campaigns, mix that sort of um, 3D puzzle, if you will, uh, multi-sensory puzzle maybe, I don't know, with, um, you know, character stuff, you know, interactions, political intrigue, um, and mix that in with like a, an overarching storyline sometimes, or at least long personal stories, stuff that you can really... Uh, you know, uh, cleave to, uh, you know, the kind of stuff that that you really look for in a console RPG, I think. And it's kind of hard to find in a console RPG occasionally, to be honest. I think, I have, I have a pretty similar perspective to White here, but I honestly think that mine's a little different. Because I feel like DMing, and this might be a mark of me as a, like a bad DM, some people would say. DMing for me is more about enabling my party to do things in a entertaining manner. Now, that doesn't that doesn't mean at all that I go easy on them or that I cheat in their favor. Certainly, I don't do that. But it's about setting up a world where those things are possible and being willing to take the story where the players want to take it. Because in the end, trying to force players onto a predisposed plot, for me, has always been a little too much like herding cats. I think for really any game master, I mean, that's that's the classic colloquialism. Trying to get gamers to do anything is like herding cats. Any D&D webcomic that's, you know, that has the game master overlay, any... In the end, I'd just rather not herd cats. What yeah. I tend to do is I as I find the place where the cats want to go, the place where the food is, um, and I put my story there. See, that's, you know, and I think that's part of my problem uh, lately as a DM. Uh, I've been told I'm a pretty good DM. Um, he is a pretty good DM. Uh, I'm not as good as I used to be, and I'm perfectly aware of that. I've gotten too resting on my laurels, and I, I've run into a couple of uh, pitfalls that have put me in an odd place. But, um... You know, I find the uh, the hardest part for me as a DM, my biggest stumbling block in achieving really good original stories, um, is that when I try to let my players explore the world, it uh, they tend to um, not. <laughs> in short, um, yeah, it's hard for me to strike that balance between you know. Leaving tiny plot threads or interesting pieces of, of story dangling for players to cleave to and um, run a fucking epic campaign. Because the epic campaign I can do. Following a storyline I can do. Um, most of the time I can even rewrite a story that got off track back where it needs to go. Sometimes it throws me for a loop and I need to take a break. But uh, most of the time I'm pretty good at that. But um, lately... Uh, the last few years uh, was what I mean by lately. Uh, it's just not been my bag. I used to be fucking, you know, go, go, go. I suppose I had random tables to help me out back then. But uh, nowadays, it's just not really not really my bag anymore, you know. And, and I, I say that not just to, not to whine on the internet, but, uh, you know, you other DMs out there, I know there are lots of folks listening to this podcast, and if the views on our D&D &D videos are anything to... Uh, 
to judge by. There's a lot of people out there who actually run games who listen to the podcast. Uh, and when you have these struggles, you are totally not alone. When you're trying to deal with an unruly player, when you're trying to deal with a fucking clever player who is too smart for your fucking plot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can tell you some stories. Um, when you're trying to deal with just trying to get the party to do stuff. Or in the very basis way, trying to get the party to, you know, be a party. Yeah, and you're not alone. And this is something that every DM is encountering, you know. Um, if I can take a brief break, because I know I can feel on the tip of your tongue some stuff you want to say. Uh, if you're having trouble or if you want to DM, honestly, interestingly enough, as much as a lot of people will bag on it, the best resources to go to are probably the Wizards of the Coast DMs guides. Third edition, fourth edition, and I'm sure the forthcoming uh, fifth, edition. fifth edition one. All of them are really great reads. Even just cover to cover, it, it will improve your ability to be a DM. To be honest with you, the fourth edition DM, DM guide two is probably better. For yeah, that. DM's guide two is better. DM's guide one was mostly just like the you know, rules. Yeah, rules. But I, I, they give you a great insight as to how to think when DMing. And that's probably the biggest challenge I find for a lot of DMs. Uh, not just the ones I've experienced personally, but the ones I've read about online, the ones I've talked to online. A lot of DMs have that have a problem of how to properly think when DMing. And what I mean by that is they they have a problem dealing with rapid change and being able to adjust appropriately and on the fly. That's as far as I'm concerned, that's probably the most important skill a DM has to have. I would agree. I mean, and I know a lot of my problem with it lately is born out of the fact that I, um, that I've been running pre-written plots written by somebody else. You know, if it were my story, I could just be like, "Fine, we'll take a shortcut, or we'll do whatever." I know the story inside and out; it's free to edit. But I'm trying to get across something, you know. You're trying to get across like a theming or, or something an integral from another person's story. And the only way to do that is to follow the story, so you kind of have to get on the choo-choo train and take a ride. Which, funny thing is, as many as those games that we've had, that's happened all of twice. Well, to be honest, Brandy and I are apparently fairly, um, I don't know, cliched role players. We, we accidentally follow the plot train a lot more often than not. Because we just go where the interesting shit is happening, and oh, look, there's the plot train. Right, well, I mean, it's just about making that kind of shit interesting. And you guys as players, and this is not a, a um, not say I'm fortune again. that, uh, no, I'm not going to say I'm again, fuck you. Uh, it's not a fortune <laughs> that uh, every DM has, um, but you guys as players want to follow the plot, generally. Um, that's not... <laughs> that's not typical. No, especially for new or young, not in terms of age, but in terms of experience, players, that's not something they want to do. They just want to fuck around. They want to they want to flex their muscles. They want to see how far they can go. What they want to do is they want to test the system. Not mechanically, but they want to find their boundaries. In, honestly, the same way a lot of devel developing human minds in actual young people want to do. They want to test their boundaries, find where the lines are. So a lot of new and, you know, uh, shall we say novice role players will do things that they would not otherwise do in what is ultimately a collaborative story medium because of the game aspect of it. It allows them the freedom to cut a rug, as it were. The freedom to, to Stretch, stretch their limbs and see where they can take things. That manifests a lot of different ways. Uh, you'll have the player who just wants to completely fuck off whatever bullshit plot you were doing and go and throw rocks into a river for like 30 minutes just to try and block it up because fuck this town. Um, I mean, you'll have the player who takes umbrage to something a bartender says and decides to shank him, despite that being a blatantly terrible idea. Then you'll have infighting. Oh, between, yeah. good old infighting. That can be a problem when DMing. Especially because so few games have classes balanced against each other. No, most games have PvE balanced classes, and as anyone who's played World of Warcraft can tell you, something that's balanced in PvE might not be so balanced in PvP. 
Um, but it's, I mean, it's all in good fun in the end. You know, I, I got a little uptight. And uh, me speaking to players more so here, I have a tendency to get a little uptight, get a lot inside my own head and be like, oh, I can't, I, I have to stick with this character. You know, we have a very important plot and everybody would be let down if I didn't stick with this character. So I better not make any mistakes or experiment much. Don't be that guy. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself as a DM either. You know, if, if your group is like, we don't want to do this, we don't want to do that, you know, give it to them in small doses. Don't force it down their throat, but... Because all it's going to do is make them want it less and make them try harder to get away from it. Yeah. Um, if, like, like, for example, if you if you have a group who doesn't want to do a dungeon crawl, doesn't like the idea of a dungeon crawl, you know... Maybe have them enter fucking three rooms on their way to another town uh, in, in an underground exit once they pissed off the cops or whatever. You know, just to give them a little flavor of it. And if after the campaign they're like, oh man, I really liked that. Just integrate yeah. slowly. Yeah. And always be willing to adjust on the fly if something isn't going well. And I don't mean necessarily, I don't mean at all the players are losing or what have you. Not going well means people aren't having a good time. Yeah, that's, it's the old wrestling adage. I don't care if you're booing or cheering, so long as you're making a reaction. Yeah. You know, if the players are fucking your entire game up and just dicking around, fine. If the players are fucking engrossed in your story and your NPCs and want more, good. Both if, of those can be great DMing. Yeah, if they're sitting there just fucking rolling dice and going, I got a three to hit, so I miss. That, that's when you're failing. Yeah, that's when it's time to take a break. That's what failure as a DM looks like, yeah. for anyone unfamiliar. Even if the players have completely derailed any plans you might have had, so long as they are having a good time, in the end, you're doing your job. Yeah. Now, ideally, in a perfect world, you are having a good time as well because you are being able to provide them an interesting experience. But that's why I say lots of people should give DMing a try. Not everyone can have fun doing that. No. And not everyone is equipped to. I know two of my friends, guys I roleplayed with for a long time, great role players in one way or another, um, but they both got behind the DM wheel and it was like, Two different kinds of, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> um, which is a shame, because they both had some really good ideas for campaigns. But uh, It's just, it's a matter of being able to put forth the overall enjoyment of the role-playing session above your own personal desires for like a very specific story or... I really wanted the players to do this here because it fits with like the theme I'm trying to go for, mm -hmm. or it fits with the order of operations I'm going for next. It's important that you put what would logically happen, or illogically happen if you're playing Paranoia, I guess, um, what would happen in your setting next as a result of player action A or B. Because that ultimately needs to, needs to fuel your decision making. It's what would happen next, and is that a good move? Is that the best move? Is there something that maybe wouldn't be as logical, but might make for a more interesting story? Like, as an example, the players decide they need to take out a bunch of bandits. And maybe they were hired, maybe they just decided on their own after hearing some rumors about these bandits. What they do is they set up an ambush on their own on this bridge. Now... What might logically happen is if the bandits have them by this bridge, the players leap all on them and, you know, fight, and since they have the advantage, they win pretty easily. It might be more interesting to have the bandits not use the bridge, or to have uh, have them go around, or to have the bridge collapse on the, on the party as the bandits are going across it because it was an old, shitty, rickety bridge. <laughs> These are all different options. Try and go for the one that makes the most interesting story, and you're not going to go wrong very often. You don't want to be like like Vince Russo, though. No. That's why I say logical. Yeah. What would logically happen. Yeah. And if what logically would happen is a bad call, if it's boring, if it's not interesting, then see if there's something less logical that is more interesting. But there's a football field between what is slightly less logical and more interesting and fucking swerve out of nowhere. You couldn't have seen this coming. Because then your players are just going to get tired. They're going to start to expect the unexpected and their imaginations are invariably going to come up with cooler shit than yours. 
Oh, that's another trick I've learned from DMing. If your players have a really, really fucking cool idea, and you can reasonably steal it, do so. Yeah, like, uh, it was in, I think, 4th edition DM's Guide 2, uh, was suggesting, it was really, really fucking blunt and asinine when they did it in there, uh, where he was talking about, I don't know, some sort of tower that was guarded by a dragon. And the guy was like, oh, well, since I'm this, I can talk to the dragon and calm him down and get him to be our friend and let us through. Because that's what I do. And, you know, and you'll have players that act like that and say shit like that. And as the DM, you know, you have the option of going, no, it's stupid. No, you can't talk to the dragon. Or you have the option, particularly probably the more interesting option, of going, eh, give it a shot. See how it works for you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I believe they said you're going to wake up an angry dragon and, and demand things of him. That should go well. <laughs> this this seems like a great plan. And fuck, for all you know, he could get up there, roll a 20, and suddenly your party's got a new way in. Yeah, you know. your party's got a new way in and a dragon, bro. Yeah, I mean, that you know that, that opens up a whole new realm of possibilities. Sure, that makes this mission easy, but then the dragon could be like, all right, I see you guys are pretty good at what you do. I need you for some stuff. I got another dragon. I want some shit out of his horde. You down to do some stealing? <laughs> um, and that's cool. Uh, you know, in, in indulging your players, um, you know, uh, working with your players, going to their expectations. That's that's that is one kind of DMing. That's what you were talking about. That's what we've been that's, talking. And that's what I usually. That's what I usually. Um, I like I like telling a story a lot, but classically as a DM, I like to challenge my players. When I was a bit, when I was younger, I, I would do that. It's been long enough that it's not a bit younger. Uh, <laughs> I would do that with battles. Battles where I just threw buckets of hit points on top of enemies, gave them blatantly unfair tactics, etc., etc. And my players had fun. It's what they wanted. It's what we were into at the time. Rolling dice and seeing what we could kill. Um, and I made them epic, and we'd play music, and there'd be, like, you know, dramatic readings and stuff. It was, it was fun. But uh, now I find it's really interesting to psychologically challenged by players. Um, Challenge their preconceived notions of things, or their perceptions. Yeah. Um, And even better, sometimes to toy with that divide between what the player knows, understands, and feels, and what their character would know, understand, and feel. Um, Case in point, and, you know, just because it was recent, it's in my head, uh, the Chrono Trigger game I've run. If you haven't played Chrono Trigger by now and don't want spoilers, this isn't really super spoilery. But also, Chrono Trigger's super old. Yeah, it's super so... old. What the fuck are you doing? But I mean, this is probably where you want to maybe tune out of the podcast for a while. But anyway, um, I changed up a lot of stuff in my version of it, but I uh, kept a lot of things the same. Boy's character is uh, uh, basically a, a small power suit pilot. Yeah. Uh, and engineer. Um, we're living in a world where there is no artificial intelligence, not unlike Mass Effect, where virtual intelligence is just fine, but artificial intelligence... Once you cross that divide... It's dangerous. Because the last, you know, all the AIs that have happened up until now have gone, you know... Skynet. Well, yeah, have gone Skynet real <laughs> um, fast. So they reach the part of the future um, where in Chrono Trigger you would encounter Robo. And Robo's a pretty cool character. He's, he's a pretty big fan favorite. Um, my wife, classically, not too into robots. Um, Just doesn't like them. Yeah, has got kind of real hate on for him. And there are lots of exceptions, so pick your jaws up off the floor. She likes C-3PO. She likes R2-D2. It, it, it's all right. She likes Data. It, it's cool. But uh, typically, a not robot a has to go the extra mile. Yeah, and especially robots that weren't from her childhood, I find, <laughs> really need to play catch-up. Um, so here, I, I knew we were going to be introducing a character like Robo, and I really wanted to maintain that personality. So, Boy's character, who is a, is a man who is, you know, of the modern age, understands the risks, is confronted with this being, which is an artificial intelligence, is speaking as an artificial intelligence does. Uh, something we need to clarify out of the character? I love robots. Oh, yeah. Robots are great. Robots are the best. Yeah. Um, so here's his character. His character is like, oh, this is dangerous. This is scary. Um, this was a bad idea. Who uh, did this? I know exactly how this goes wrong. Uh, out of character, he's excited. You know, because it's a cool robot buddy. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, I took it to the nines. I went from Robo to fucking, I don't know, what kind of sweet ass mascot character <laughs> went from Robo to Groot, okay? Yeah. <laughs> With a full vocabulary. It's just like this freaking puppy dog. Oh, of a yeah, robot. I'm a human, well, a human being, of a robot, yeah. Um, Brandy, meanwhile, her character has no reason to distrust robots. And in fact, he's so fucking nice and sweet that in character and a little bit out of character, she's like, what, what, what a great guy. You know, so, uh, you don't want to go too far, obviously. You don't want to, you know. There's a line. And if you're a functional member of society, you know where the line is. Yeah, don't, don't be cross Lenny. It. You know, pet the rabbits. <laughs> it's, it's very simple, you know? Um, and that that was fun for me. That was a fun challenge. You know, I played a couple of those throughout that campaign. And it was the first time in a long time I felt alive DMing. Like, I was really offering something for my players to chew on. The rest of the campaign was like a super fucking condensed Chrono Trigger or two. I mean, that you know, that is one of the standout moments for me. Whereas usually it was those epic boss battles and confrontations with, well, you're fighting fucking Lavos. Who gives a shit? But, uh, I don't know. I think I made Lavos pretty scary, though. You did. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. I also enjoy challenging my players, but I typically, I typically err more on the side of, of the second thing. I, I want my battle scenes as a DM to be challenging. I want them to, I want there to be a very real risk of people losing of the players losing if they don't play smart. That's so, that's sort of where I hold the bar. But, and this is where I always try things. I, I try to emphasize awesome things. I, I try and make my campaigns as awesome as I possibly can. And the way to do that is to enable players to think smart and enable them, when they think smart, to be rewarded for doing so. But that's sort of a side to what I want to talk about. When I challenge my players, I like to challenge their preconceptions of what exactly is the situation when they're role-playing. What what they're seeing versus what is the truth in the in the setting. I, I, so inverting and, and subverting tropes, basically. Yeah, subverting tropes and trying for a bit of an unreliable narrator feel. Um, you can't really trust your character's perceptions about things because obviously they're going to have preconceptions. So, so, he's, um, he's, I was talking about the cat. Um, <laughs> Stop it, Gogolins, we're talking about D&D. &D. Uh, anyway. But, Challenging preconceived notions. Oh, so, uh, I'll tell this story, because it's, it's, it's what is most recently in my head, DMing-wise, and it's probably one of my biggest victories as a DM. Huh. Um, he knows the story. Yeah, I do. I was there. I'm going to do a super condensed version, because... We ain't got that kind of time. We ain't got that kind of time. We're only half with the podcast, kids. We ain't got that kind of time. So, um, they decided to start a new fantasy campaign. Um, both of them wanted it, and I was like, cool. I have a really cool story that works really well, and you know, it's a very epic fantasy story, because up until, up until that point, that's what Brandy had really, really wanted out of most of her fantasy campaigns. And it's and sports always down for that sort of thing too, so it worked. I get started with the campaign, and Brandy and Sports character immediately shoot right off the rails into an entire other game that they decided they want to play. I completely and utterly went with it because I saw an opportunity as a DM to make things more interesting, to make things more. It, yeah, I believe the comparison you often make is it's like if you started up Skyrim and then instead of, you know, going the way the plot quietly guides you, bolting toward Riften and being like, Thieves Guild time! Exactly. <laughs> Just full on, you know what, screw all this stupid dragon bullshit, I'm gone, I'm gonna go to Riften because I want to steal some shit. Um, they, it was a Thieves, you know, it was a Thieves Guild storyline, that sort of thing. And I saw an opportunity because... They were both people who saw what they were doing as not necessarily bad things. Certainly not, you know, right and justice and altruistic and I am a paladin things. They, they thought they were just normal people. And I saw an opportunity to show how no one thinks they're the villain of the story. 
So I kept presenting them throughout the campaign with opportunities wherein their characters, who were very pragmatic people, would be given an option to do something that was pretty blatantly evil in one way or another, but was more pragmatic, was more efficient, and got them closer to their goal. And I kept reinforcing this mechanic by having, when they did these things, having them turn out well, because, well, honestly, that was because they won. They won the fights, they outsmarted the villains, that sort of thing. I had them continually fighting people who were more evil than them, so that there's always someone they could look at and go, no, that guy's obviously the bad guy, I'm fine. And I had them continually be rewarded for these sorts of actions, so that there would be a feedback loop. These very pragmatic individuals would slowly start gravitating towards the more, shall we say, aggressively pragmatic options. <laughs> Aggressive pragmatism. It's the new evil. And it worked. Completely. I, it's probably one of my biggest victories as a DM. I tricked two of my players into playing the villains of the story. And the campaign's not over yet, but I've done the, I've revealed this to them already. It's why I'm fine saying in front of Spork, because I, I kept this from them until it was already, until it was already done. Until they were at Terminus Est, until they were a part of Team Bad Guys. And it was, it felt, it felt really good to bring home that message of, you know, no one thinks they're the bad guy, but some of, our, some of the people are. Yeah. And well, that's... I, you know, and you don't normally think about it. I mean, even when you're playing, like, uh, you know, the rogue, chaotic, uh, chaotic neutral even. I mean, you're going to do some dark shit. It's all in the name of the greater good, but it's also all in the name of your opinion of the greater good. To a lawful good paladin, a chaotic neutral rogue's greater good is not good enough. And he's, he's evil. <laughs> and is... we're not the most chaotic neutral of people. Um... <laughs> so it, it works. And it worked in a way that I think, like, just having them play characters whose alignment was evil in all intents and purposes and having the dastardly villain, villainous, villainous acts wouldn't have. Because these characters and the players needed to feel like they were the heroes. Needed to feel like they were doing what was right. So and, you know, we still do. I mean... In character, they still do, yeah. Well, and out of character, I mean, you know, yeah, you, you can sit there and you can label the character's actions as evil, just as any character in the game could. But, and this is something that's been a belief of mine for a long time, it's all a matter of perspective. I mean, you know, there's a line where you're doing something clearly bad, but you don't care, or indeed you enjoy the fact that it's bad. That's not really what these characters are doing. These characters are working outside established laws. These characters are organizing crime, which is better than crime running rampant for no reason, you know, willy-nilly everywhere, but um, still crime, still... Murdering, thieving, pivoting. Still profiting off the suffering of others. Sure, yeah, exactly. And that's that's not in any stretch of the imagination what the good guys do. But uh, they see themselves as good guys. A lot of people in the world see themselves as good guys. Yeah, a lot of people, and the fun, flat, the fun part is, a lot of people in the campaign world see them as good guys. Because they have amazing PR. Yeah, uh, both characters are incredible talkers. Um, I mean, you know, if, if, if I told you that I was playing a campaign, like, you and I have just met, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, one of the, one of the biggest campaigns that's drawn to a close I'm playing right now, uh, just a little three-person thing, it's what we usually do, it's a DM, of course. Uh, myself, I am playing the orc barbarian, um, who united all of the orc tribes and is now a pirate king. And uh, my wife, Brandy, she is playing uh, the head of the Assassin's Guild. Oh, so it's an evil campaign, then. <laughs> well, no, 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 not at all. It's, it's not like that. And, uh, you know, evil campaigns, evil campaigns are tricky. Because there's, there's the more juvenile evil campaign, where everybody just does stuff for the evils. Yeah, where you, you know... Dig a big pit just outside town, light fire to one side of town, and watch all the villagers run into the big pit. It's oh, it's 
Congratulations, you've reached the role-playing maturity of someone with Gary's mod. Excellent work. And I mean, it's fun, and there's a place for it, but it's not... You're not really experiencing the evil campaign. To experience the evil campaign, you have to want to do these things for the right reason that are wrong things. And, and I mean, like, for a long time, years, I've held this opinion, you know... This is probably why I get along so well with uh, concepts of, you know, alien cultures and things like that is because I just don't, you know, what's right in our world, what's right in our culture isn't necessarily right in somebody else's culture, and we have no high ground to talk about it like that. I mean, that's just... Why do we, how, who are we to sit in judgment of them? Yeah, I mean, they, they're just as easy to sit in judgment of us, you know, there's no point to it, it doesn't serve anybody. Um, the D&D alignment chart for me has always been more of a... A guideline to figuring out how, what kind of person you're playing. If you don't have a full, you know, full, complete person sitting in your head waiting to talk, because not many people do, that's kind of a rare skill is it's it's great shorthand. Yeah. Uh, that's actually, 5th edition does a lot of great shorthand. It does the origins and the flaws and the, you know, this is this is my ideals, this is the, the flaw in my character, this is my alignment. It's all great ways you can use to try and guide your own role playing, try and figure out exactly who you're playing, like the character that you're... You, Excuse me, my cat just bolted behind the couch. He is feeling frisky. You are going to hear thumpity thumps and meow. He's having a great time. He does that. He's, he's not stuck or anything. He kind of looked like he was. Yeah, I know. When I was watching all those uh, Five Nights at Freddy's videos, uh, he, uh, he would do that. And he'd hit the door there, so it would be like this. And I'm like, that. And I was like, shit! <laughs> Fox is here! <laughs> hey! Oh. He's a great cat. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, you know, evil is, uh, evil is pragmatic. Aggressive pragmatism. The more I think about it, the more I really like that. Where as good is the, the altruism, uh, you know. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it, and in D and D games will categorize it as you know chaotic is... evil is is just wanton slaughter. Not necessarily, because if you take these concepts by their individual basis, chaos is just the disrespect of law. It is not following the the structured order, you know. And, and evil is ignoring this altruism, is being pragmatic and selfish. Yeah, and selfish, yeah. There are depths of chaotic evil that get too dark to come back from, but they are not necessarily on the surface. It's the D and D alignment chart. Like I said, great shorthand. It's not yeah. a bible. No, yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. But as far as DMing is concerned, uh, that that's probably one of my biggest victories as a DM. Yeah. Um. What do you think? It, let's. Uh, just to give the opposite side of the coin, because this has been a lot of us talking talking ourselves up. What do you think was one of your biggest failure as a DM? Um, because I know what mine is. What do you mean? You know, and actually, I know you've been talking a lot, but uh, what's yours? So I can kind of gauge what you mean. My biggest failure as a DM: the moment when I was being fair, I was being just, I was following all the rules, and I still managed to ruin the campaign. By not, by being fair, being just, and following all the rules, without any regard to what makes a better story. It was during a campaign years and years ago. It was with White and Brandy, and this campaign had been going on for a long time. It was actually my first campaign, and oh, I think I know what you're talking about. There came a point when I had left the players; they had to get into a place. If they did get into a place by a certain time, the bad guys would win, essentially. And these were bad, bad guys. Very, very... Not like, you know, bandits, like raper dudes. Yeah, very bad men would get in um, and do bad, bad things. And their entire job there was to stop the bad things from happening. I had left them some very set ways to get in. They could have snuck in. They could have, you know, tried to bluff their way in. They could have done a million different things. 
Unfortunately, the genius of the group whom I was playing, uh, I'd been pretty fatigued from playing a lot, so my genius wasn't working so well. Uh, I believe I chose the through the front door with a raised fist strategy. Yeah, he, um, when he says genius of the group, like, he's not tooting his own horn. That it was literally the characters, but he's playing essentially Sherlock Holmes. He was playing the guy who's and whose effective intelligence is so high, he could look at a mystery and just sort of point at it from the outside of the mystery and go, is that guy? And then walk away. I, I, you know, this is me tooting White's horn. That wasn't from any traits that the character took. White just does that. That's why I don't tend to DM mystery campaigns anymore with him, because, and this is a warning to anyone who DMs for White, don't do a mystery. Because unless he's actively trying, he will solve it. Yeah, I... Uh... Uh, with my current character. The character in the fantasy campaign. I, I shut that part of my brain off. Just because it's, it's just too he's easy. He's not that guy. He's, he's an orc barbarian king. I mean, he's he's smart. He was raised in human lands and everything, but he's not he's not that smart. But, um... So, this was, you know, a guy I had been able to depend on. I could depend on Brandy's character as, my, as the DM. I could depend on her to handle most of the fights. Because she makes combat monsters in her sleep. She makes combat monsters by virtue of rolling ridiculously well. Yeah, a warning to anyone who DMs for Brandy. If she starts rolling, and, you know, she's rolling out on the table, everyone can see it, it's just, you know, 18, 19, 20 on a d20, or if you're rolling with, like, any other dice, it's just the highest, like, top quarter percentile, always. Okay, fair warning, that isn't gonna stop. No. Balance around it, because yeah. it's not gonna stop. Yeah. She's just... She's the most ridiculously lucky role player. And it's it's not like, you know, she's like this sneaky who's got loaded dice. I have bought her her dice sets. Me, personally. I think all the dice she has, I personally bought her. Except for the one weird shape one. She bought those all. Yeah, she did. Um, but they weren't weighted. No. I mean, they're just those little crystal dice. Trust me. Like, we, we've, we, the two of us have used those dice. And they're fine. She they're just, just got incredible incredible luck with dice. Um, but, so she, I could handle her, I could count on her to handle combat. I could count on White's character to find the solution to the puzzle. So I went and I made a puzzle with solutions. And he decided to disregard the puzzle and go charging in the front door in the loudest, brashest, most ridiculous possible manner with no backup plan. For some reason. I was being fair, I was being just, and I was punishing him, I was punishing my players for taking a blatantly stupid action. But it ruined the campaign. Because that loss was so important to the characters that it ruined their motivation to adventure. Essentially. Yeah, mostly my character. It, it, shorthand was, version for you veteran DMs out there. He made the paladin fall. Entirely on accident. Entirely on accident. You're not that malicious kind of... I keep making your paladins fall on accident. Eh, my paladins have character flaws. and They're gaping, Thus truck they drivable ones. Yeah, you could, that, that's not... But that's, that was probably my biggest failure as a DM. I was too caught up in what should logically happen, and I was unwilling to make that bend between what should logically happen and what might be less logical but makes for a better story. What do you think your biggest failure as a DM was? To um, it back? Man, what a great question. I've been DMing a lot longer than you, so I've got like a, a lot more to draw from. Yes, you have, and yes, you do. My biggest failure... Um, I have a lot of small regrets. Um, you know, uh, you know those lines that like even we in DMing books say, don't cross with your players... Uh, in terms of content for games, I wish I hadn't crossed by as many of those lines when I was younger, but I don't know if that's my biggest failing. I mean, I'm still friends with all those people, so it couldn't have been that bad. Um, you may have gone full that guy a couple times. I have gone full that guy more times than I'm comfortable with. I'll sit around thinking about old characters and campaigns and stuff and go, oh yeah, that was fun until I did all of that stuff. That was, that was gross. Uh, <laughs> um... And there was that one time the dice and bad homebrew killed your one character and basically ruined a campaign. But we made that better later, so I don't feel that so was, bad that about was, that. that. That wasn't a failure of you. That was the dice. That was the dice and, and a bad homebrew. Uh, well, 
it could have been better homebrew. Um, it balanced around Brandy rolling high homebrew. Yeah. Uh, I mean, really, personally, what I feel is my biggest failing as a DM is me losing the ability to craft original campaigns. And that's something that I've been working really hard to gain back. And I'm really excited to start a 5th edition campaign because while a lot of the set dressing is going to be heavily borrowed from something else, one, it's not... It's more like your current fantasy campaign, which, you know, it, it, it takes a little bit from Westeros. It takes a little bit from other fiction. Um, but oh, it, that's my other tip for... Be, for okay, let me get closer to the... D, that's my other tip for good DMing. Steal. Like Eddie Guerrero. Lie, cheat, steal. I steal so much from so much stuff that Eric's never seen, that Eric doesn't know I'm stealing from. I steal liberally. Your uh, your Dark Tower campaign. But oh, I had yeah. no idea what was going on. I did an entire campaign based around the storyline of Stephen King's Dark Tower novels. An entire an entire uh, cult role playing system campaign. And we've talked about this before, I believe. Uh, yeah. Um, and I read up on the Dark Tower later because I haven't read those because I fail as a human being. Yeah, that's why. And uh, good job, good job for mentioning. <laughs> I was reading up on those and I was like, oh, this was that character. That was this character. This was this situation. And he's like, yep, 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 yep. Only part I skipped was that. And I was like, I can tell because that never happened. Um, that I skipped was something lame. Yeah. Uh, like even something weird ass that we came up with. We suddenly uh, it was a post apocalyptic campaign. We suddenly became obsessed with going to get some peaches in Georgia. Before we went to the final boss. Uh, and this was like Brandy and I's idea. We were like, we need to get some peaches. And lo and behold, there was something toward the end of the Dark Tower that was like that. I was like, weird. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Uh, stealing is good. File off the serial numbers. Try not to make it obvious. And if you're a player and you're listening out there, man, don't call your DM on it. You know why? You know why you shouldn't call your DM on it? Because, one, you might be wrong. Two, if you call him, he's going to swerve you, and you're not going to like what happens after that. Man, three, it's just not cool. Like, you know, um, a, a good a good thing that happened. Um, you guys took a long time to call me on this shit. I was running a 1930s uh, supernatural campaign. I'm going to be honest, it took me a long time to realize what you were doing. Oh, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was pretty obvious. Um, uh, In retrospect, yeah. Yeah, painfully. Um, they were, uh, it was a supernatural setting. There was a masquerade in place, like Vampire the Masquerade. Um, a uh, boy was playing what amounts to a healer priest. Brandy was playing a, a pyromancer, pyrokinetic character. Um, and they were up against some crazy shit. But mostly they were doing some gangster stuff. Yeah. Uh, 1930s gangsters. Um, Italian guys fucking shit up in Chicago. Um. And I had four relatives in this little crime family, this little out branch that was sent off to Chicago from New York. Uh, there was Lothario, who was the Don. Um, his brother, whose name escapes me off the top of my head. Could you do I'll try and remember it. Um, there was Vincenzo. Who they were like cousins, they were distantly related, but they are part of the same family. Um, he was a cool dude, uh, had that kind of doofy, hey, yo, how's it going, you know, accent. And uh, then there was the guy whose name I didn't even change, Mario. Yeah, didn't even change it at all. And, I mean, like, I was doing a really super bastardized version of the, uh, I mean, both of these characters' voices. I was doing a super bastardized version of the the old uh, 90s Mario Brothers cartoon uh, with uh, fucking... Captain Lou Albano? Yeah, Captain Lou Albano and uh, that guy who played Luigi, whose who name I... wasn't Captain Lou Albano? No, oh, tch. man. He died last year. Shut up. Made me all I mean, sad. It's now I'm depressed. Anyway, um... But yeah, that's what those voices were. It was, uh, you know, it wasn't anything. And I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna call the guy Mario. Who gives a shit? Um, Didn't even notice. Because Mario's an Italian name. Uh, they were up against a, a mysterious enemy from overseas named Cooper Brown. Um, Cooper Brown. I did not notice this. I need to clarify how stupid I was. Because I was so in character. As, you know, I was so playing my priest and just enjoying that. 
and who turns Super Mario Brothers <laughs> into a noir 1930s style gangster campaign? Who does that? This crazy fat man. Thing. I've always wanted to do a 1930s style gangster Super Mario Brothers storyline. I think it would be so cool. Seriously? That's... I did not know that's been a lifelong dream. Really? I, you didn't see the old sketches I did? And I was well, going to do a comic. Those were very 80s. I guess it was kind of 80s. But regardless, I've always wanted to do a, an, uh, a mobster campaign. Uh, or storyline or whatever. Yeah, no. I, that, like I said, it was, it was dumb that I didn't notice in retrospect. Yeah, but... Um, it took until the damn flying turtle showed up. And yeah, like, oh you guys God. had gone through the warp zone. <laughs> there were flying turtles and you were like, you shit it. <laughs> <laughs> you enormous shit lord. But you didn't call me on it. I, we started making jokes. You started making quiet jokes, but they, you weren't you weren't a dick about it. And... And that's important, you know, because then it's like, okay, yeah, you guys get what's going on. We all get what's going on here. That's the joke. You point it out, and you ruin it. You ruin the joke. You're, you're punching holes in kayfabe. You're, you're destroying your sense of immersion. I mean... It's like if, in a wrestling federation, right before the match, John Cena grabs a microphone and goes, Hey, listen, my merch sales are down 3%, so I'm winning this match. Because we need to drive up them profit margins. Oh, or to those of you out there who aren't wrestling fans who are listening to this is a D&D podcast, um, it's like watching a movie and those actors, those really strong character actors who you can't divorce from previous roles. Um, you know, your Nicolas Cage's, your Christopher Walken's, your et cetera, et cetera. Um, it ruins the movie for you because you're like, no way is Stifler Jesus. Yeah, no way is Stifler Jesus. I think that's probably the most quintessential example. Yeah, and... No, you can't enjoy it. You can't get into it because you're, you're fucking blowing holes in the... In the, in the idea. It breaks your willing suspension of disbelief. Yeah, and that's important for a campaign. It's important for being into a campaign. Unless you're just fucking around and fighting shit, then whatever, make all the jokes you want. But if the, if the DM's trying to tell a story, man, don't, don't punch holes in it. And as a DM, file off those fucking serial numbers, because one of those assholes is going to punch Holson. <laughs> look, it is a mutual responsibility. The player's responsibility is to... Your responsibility is to file the serial numbers off as much as possible. Change the names to protect the innocent. Hide them under a sheet. But steal, if you need to, because, oh god, is it so easy. Um, the player's responsibility is to, once they have uncovered all of these many, many things you should have done to file off the serial numbers, their job is to not point it the fuck out. I mean, it's as bad as, you know, pointing out why a joke is funny. You really deflate the joke. It just murders it. Ha 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 is funny because it's true. That murders the joke. That That's kind of a small one. I mean, it's more like, you know, why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? Ha ha ha, it's funny because it's pointing out the obvious and ignoring typical joke parameters. Let's all have a good laugh about the math behind that. Oh wait, I've gone and ruined it all. Um, but yeah, my biggest failing as a DM, uh, not being stricter about the confines of a campaign. Okay. That's um, interesting. Yeah. Talking about very I've I've kind of let a couple of campaigns go a little longer than I should have, just because I like to indulge my players a lot. You know, um, I'm no by no means a Monty Hall DM by any stretch of the imagination. I really like to challenge my players, uh, be that in combat or mentally or whatever, emotionally. Uh, that's fun too. Um, but. I, I also like to be like, hey, here's some cool powers, you know, here's some cool items. It's that line between giving them so much they can no longer be reasonably challenged and giving them enough to be really cool. Yeah, here's a cool NPC you can really have some fun with and open up with and be, you know, experience his character a little more. Uh, there's a couple of campaigns where, and it's usually just been you guys, although I, I think I did it once or twice back in the day. My group has just been having so much fun that we were like, fuck it, let's... Let's keep going past what is obviously the end of this campaign. Because we like these characters, and we like their story, and we don't want it to end. 
despite the fact that it logically should end. And it just, it always leaves this, like, nasty little button. It's like the post-script season of Scrubs. Yeah. The ending of that show is good. The ending of that show is the ending of that show. That extra season on the end is just, it just makes the rest of the show leave a bad taste in your mouth. It's like, this is a divisive one, The Dark Knight Rises. It's like The Matrix Revolution. Yeah, I think that's a better, uh, more... It's, you can't, you watch The Matrix Revolution, and a part of you can't enjoy the beauty that was The Matrix anymore. Or even if you prefer it, it's like the Star Wars prequels. I mean, not quite in the same sense of flow of continuity, but you went on, and you did more stuff, and maybe you shouldn't have. Maybe, maybe that wasn't the best call. Maybe it would have been better if it were just three movies. Maybe. I'm not going to get into that right now. Um... And I've done that a couple of times, and it's it's been meandering and farty and just not very good um, compared to the rest of the campaign. The I'm one that sticks out the most in my mind is uh, a campaign that um, went into the future and into an alternate reality where they were saving the world from what amounted to the muse of sad music and poetry and art because he had become so sad that he was going to destroy the entire world with all of his sadness. And like the reincarnation of Christ was there and there was all this biblical shit and they met the king of all demons. And (laughs) this is by the way, this is all because he ran out of, uh, he ran out of uh, stuff to do for our relatively normal supernatural thriller campaign. Yeah, I mean, th- th- shit went off the rails. This would be going off the rails that was good. I wasn't done playing yet. But, uh, you know, they, they, they did it. And it wasn't really a boss fight. It was kind of like press X to win. They talked him down. Which is really what you'd have to do. I mean, you know, how do you... How I do you fight I, a god? How do you fight a god? Furthermore, if someone is sad, is the solution to help them really to beat the shit out of them? <laughs> Won't that just make them sadder? Um, yeah, it was very much the end of uh, Earthbound. Um, but, uh, and it should have ended there. You know, he restored their reality, he sent them back to their own time, all was well. And they were like, ah, but we like these characters, let's play some more. And I was like, all right. There's nothing else for you to do. Yeah, I mean, it was all like... You guys it was like Conan are, on his throne. You guys are just... You, you've just... You've won. There's nothing else that can reasonably challenge you. Although, kind of like the, the postscript stuff that you'll see a lot in uh, older JRPGs, where you can load up your post-game save and still fuck around. But you're obviously just fucking yeah, around. Yeah, it's like, well, that was nice. Um, I'm glad I have all this stuff in my house. Time to play a different game. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. I don't have that problem. I've never had that problem. I, it's... That, that, that is... I get where that comes from. Yeah. But I always try and set very hard expectations. And, you know, I do from now on. I mean, that's a big mistake I have. And so I think I've heard a lot of campaigns. It's a but... failing you, you hope you've gotten over. Yeah. Same for me. I, I, I hope my big failing of... Uh, I hope it's something that I've gotten over. Yeah. Well, and you know, I still have a lot of shortcomings as a DM. I'm not trying to sit here and say, I'm so fucking great, you don't even know. No. I. Mm, no. If I'm doing an overarching story and I'm confronted with something that fucks with the timeline and it's somebody else's overarching story, like I said earlier, I, I panic. I shut down. I have to stop the game for a minute while I collect my thoughts. I've lost the ability to do original stuff easily. Um... My Although view. most of, despite the fact that the setting around that 30s campaign was, was Super Mario, the, the content is original. Um, I have, my smaller failings as a DM is, I, I try and enable awesome stuff, and if it fails, it ends up me enabling player characters who are just too powerful to be reasonably challenged. If I'm going to do something, it's going to be that. Um, and I do it, I'm not doing it intentionally, I'm doing it entirely on accident, because I'm just doing what would logically happen when players succeed at this ridiculous thing. They would get a ridiculous reward, because it's a high-risk, high-reward gamut. Well, then they've gotten a high reward. So now they're, you know, super powerful, 
super freaking rich. You know, your campaigns really thrive on high-risk, high-reward gambits. And I think part of that is because of the system you you typically run games in. It benefits um, high-risk, high-reward Yeah, I mean, that's play. basically a lot of the, the concept around the system itself. But that's half the reason uh, we haven't finished the, that fantasy campaign. We probably could have finished it by now. Well, you definitely could have finished it by now. There's not that much left. But, but it's like, what if we fail? What if what if the final note to this whole amazing adventure is, and then you guys fucked up the end? <laughs> because when I run high risk, high reward play, it is high risk. If you fail, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah, and it's... and as the campaign goes, the risks get higher. But the problem is, it crosses a sort of DBZ Godzilla threshold. This campaign hasn't, but I've run campaigns in the past that have, where. I've, they, they've tried so much crazy bullshit, and because at least one of them is ridiculously lucky, it's continued to work. Um, so now they're just so ridiculously powerful that unless I start throwing Death Stars at them, I can't reasonably challenge them. Which, by the way, in one Star Wars campaign that I had accidentally done that in, that was my plan. <laughs> they literally throw Death Stars at us? Like, continually produce Death Stars that you guys have to destroy, yes. Oh. Was this the one where I rammed a spaceship into a planet? No, that was the sequel. Ah, okay. Where you rammed things up from the previous campaign. Yeah. Where you just wrapped a spaceship into another spaceship. Yeah. <laughs> he decided that, as a Jedi, killing the qu- a quarter of the population of a planet would probably be the best move. I got disbarred from Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> you get out of Jedi, you. <laughs> you, you. We don't want to do this because you're really good at your job, but oh my god, so many souls screaming at unison and then suddenly gone quiet. This is just like... <laughs> That's like super bad for the Force. <laughs> the midichlorians are sad, they're telling us. <laughs> the the midichlorians told me, they told me you're a dick. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... This is this is my biggest problem. My one of my biggest smaller problems as a DM. I've learned a lot of how to rein it back as I as I continue to DM, but it's not that yeah. I'm too nice. It's that when they pull something off, I reward too well. I, I think you have reined it back. We're not really ridiculous. It's just the stakes are so high. And I think I've re- I think I've managed in this fantasy campaign at least to yeah. reward you in proportion to the amount of crazy bullshit you've pulled. Yeah. Um. You know the other piece of advice that I really think is is invaluable to a DM that you're not necessarily going to find in any book? Hmm. Try new things. Yeah, don't be afraid to try something you've not tried before. Don't be afraid to try, like, a a style of role-playing that you don't think you're going to be good at. Or a style of encounter that you think might not be your forte. Because you'll never know, as a DM, if you're good at something, Unless you actually try to do it. Yeah, I've had just as many campaigns where all the fun was had in rolling dice, beating monsters, getting big numbers, and and kicking ass, as I have where all the fun was in not rolling a single die the entire night, except when I wasn't sure what sort of character motivation I needed to have, so I checked randomly. I mean... (laughs) You know, there's there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff to be had there, and as a DM, you know, I, I mean, to have gone to be the guy who went from the R O L L playing DM to a far more story based DM, it's a hard transfer. There's that part of me that still, when you guys are like, "All right, well, we get out on the road," I'm like, "I better roll some dice and see what sort of shit attacks them," just because that's what I was raised DMing doing. But, uh... That, that's not a thing that happens a lot in our role-playing group with me and Brandy as players. Because Brandy's ridiculously lucky, and I'm good at fighting in D&D and similar systems. That's what I did growing up, so I'm good at it. Um, so it just ends up being mostly a way to pass... It ends up being unnecessary padding and free treasure. Yeah. Well, or, you know, part of it... too hard and we die. <laughs> part of it also is that you guys usually run in a, in a, in a setting, in a, in a system, that the experience isn't tied directly to a thing you kill. Yeah, it's not like, you know, murder is not the quickest way to enlighten. Yeah, it's, it's like a White Wolf game where you get credit for being awesome there. and helping and, you know. Um, 
sometime we're just going to have to do a podcast. It's like, hey, White has an RPG system. Would you like to know more? Why in? Uh, well, that time we, is not now. Because we keep mentioning it, yeah. and that's slightly unfair to you, listener, but it's where a lot of our role playing yeah, shows play up. testing has been... Years. Like, I almost didn't even go for this whole 5th edition thing just because I was like, when the fuck am I ever going to use that? I had to convince him to do it because... I kind of want to play some just. I just kind of want to play some fucking D and D, yo. Yeah, it's been a long fucking time since we've just played D and D. I mean, fourth edition, yeah, but that's not. That don't count. Um, it's a fun game. I don't know if it's D and D. Um, yeah, that's me being semantic. It's D and D. It has the brand name on it, but it's not what I remember as D and D. I don't know. It doesn't scratch the itch. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. But, do you have anything else you wanted to cover? Um, gosh, it seems like, you know, I, I delightfully you brought up exactly what I wanted to in this podcast. Uh, I tell you what, let's close on this. Um, what do you think is your favorite kind of, of situation, of group dynamic, of setting to DM? Hmm. Not system, that's, let's not go there, but. No, 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 um, my favorite setting to DM, my favorite kind of thing to DM, I think, is what I'll say more is world building DMing. And I'll explain what that is because it sounds like a weird term that I... I think I understand what you mean, but for the sake of Ultima Dragon. I like being able to give my players a fully fleshed world and just set them loose. Yeah, that's And nice. watch them upturn apple carts. That's <laughs> yeah. my favorite kind of DM. So you, you like to be Bethesda in that sense. And it's just, I here is Skyrim. Go nuts. That's cool. I, I used to do a lot of that. I think my favorite kind is... Um, <sighs> if your favorite is, is Bethesda, my favorite is uh, Bioware. Uh, he's this Mass Effect, this Dragon Age, um, where the the plot does have a really or the plot, excuse me, the, the setting is very rich and there's lots to explore if you so choose, but you never really do get to see it all, and it always kind of leaves you wanting more. What really drives the campaign is a goal, no matter what that goal is. If it's a big story, if it's a small story, if it's a collection of small stories, um, and really great player characters, and NPCs, be they hero or villain. I love a good, you know, villain for the players to hate. Um, that's why I think my Final Fantasy VI and Final Fantasy IX campaigns went so well. The Kefka and Kuja XBs I had were good interpretations of those characters. I still hate the Kefka XB, by the way. So, uh, yeah. I still um, hate that guy. That was uh, a douche. <laughs> I really played up the nihilism in, in Kefka and, you know, went away from the happy-go-lucky clown thing and more into a broody, sort of, almost Sephirothish kind of character. Um, still very effeminate, but... Uh, I don't... I never really hated the Kuja XP. Well, you weren't supposed to. You were Zidane. <laughs> <laughs> On accident. Um, your accident, maybe. Half Sedan, <laughs> half Vivi. That was interesting. But, um, he, he did kind of make you pissed off, though. There were those sent, those times, like when you were in the Black Mage Village, and... Oh, God. And you were like, fuck oh, this guy! <laughs> <laughs> that was fire and brimstone, man. That's still one of the most depressing fucking things I've seen roleplay. But you don't have to hate him, necessarily. You know, I think, honestly, most of the time when you were chasing him down, you wanted to understand him. Here is something else that is also me in a world that has no other me's. What is going what on? What are you? And then when you confront uh, the uh, Garland XP, and and he goes all crazy, go nuts. You're like, but I, this isn't, this doesn't have to be your fate. I can help you. If you just shut the fuck up and listen for a minute. <laughs> You know, it, it doesn't have to be hate that drives you toward a villain. I mean, fucking uh, the Lavos XP, Pasha Ogan, was not evil. It was, it was evil in the same way a tsunami is evil. Yeah, it was hungry. It was just doing its thing. But you guys still really wanted to fucking end it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, a lot, a lot. Yeah. And, you know, it didn't, it didn't do nothing. But really. what did it do? But, yeah, and, and it was still like, no, fuck this thing. So, yeah, this just, this really, and I'm borrowing from other people's villains, so I don't know if that really counts, but whatever. No, it's, whether or not you created the character isn't important. It's, it's true, whether or not the, the, the portrayal. Is and the NPCs, those are largely of my own making. Uh, Puck had very little to do with um, Freya or uh, actual Puck from Final Fantasy IX, excepting that he was also a rat dude. <laughs> Puck. Puck was a bro. Puck was a bro. Puck, Puck was um, God. Who would you even compare him to? Um, a chill ass Leonardo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can see that. Hanging around gambling houses, drinking tea, being cool. A chill. Yeah, Leonardo. chill as fuck. He. Not any of the stick up is cloaca. No. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um yeah, I think that's I think that's what I like to do. I like to I like to have a little world and yeah, there's all kinds of stuff to see and do. But you don't have to like Disney World. If you do it all, you feel somehow unfulfilled. It's better to just fucking go through the haunted mansion a couple of times and be like see things you hadn't seen before and sit down and have breakfast with Pooh, you know? I get it. I do. Yeah. I think the listener does as well. Yes. The listener's a smart person. And Ultimate beautiful. Dragon, you're very smart. <laughs> oh, I am assured, quite beautiful. Um, <laughs> He's a handsome fella. And I normally try and go with something clever here, but I think this has just been a nice, f- complete wrap-up. I don't need to. Everything is better when nerds talk about it. Fuck it, let's go hardcore! Blood, pain, we're all insane. Suffer head trauma, destroy our brain.